Hey, what's up everybody? Guy Fieri here for a special edition of Triple D, 3D Statics. Let's check it out. Alright, hi everyone. Welcome to the first lecture that will introduce concepts related to 3D statics, which will be the first concept that is highlighted on your final exam. So, what's the plan moving forward? Today's lecture, or lecture one, in a three lecture series, will introduce 3D statics. We'll talk about 3D force vectors, and we'll really spend a lot of time talking about things called unit vectors. And, of course, we'll do an example problem at the end. Lecture two, or our next lecture, will introduce a concept related to matrix math, and how matrices can be used to solve 3D problems faster, and perhaps more efficiently and we'll do an example problem or two that illustrates how to do that. In lecture three, we'll begin to talk more about moments and three-dimensional rotations. We'll discuss a concept called cross product, which will be the strategy we use to solve those types of problems, and of course, at the end, we'll do some examples. So, let's do it an introduction to 3D statics. And to introduce the concepts here, we'll look back at some of the things that we've done in the past and explain how 3D statics, although it looks very quite scary and perhaps very confusing, like this cube down below us, 3D statics isn't much more complicated than what you've been doing already with 2D statics. Essentially, you're gonna do almost everything exactly the same with one extra dimension added in. So to introduce 3D statics, we'll first show you what you've been doing in 2D, and then I'll explain how you map the 2D work that you've been doing into a three-dimensional problem. So, let's talk about unit vectors and vectors in general. If we look at this force or distance right here, we have a triangle with a base of three, a height of four, and a magnitude of r. Now, if we wanted to solve for the magnitude of r, what we could do is use Pythagorean theorem and say that r is equal to the square root of three squared plus four squared. And we know that the answer to that would be five. That's one way to represent r as a magnitude or a whole number. The other thing that we could do is represent r as a vector, which essentially would be 3i plus 4j. This tells us that our r magnitude has three units in the x and four units in the y. And this is where we can introduce the concept of unit vector. A unit vector is effectively the vector form of a distance or force divided by the magnitude. So in this particular example, what we'll find is that the unit vector of r is equal to 3i plus 4j, the vector form, divided by the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is our magnitude. What this leads us to is a final answer that our unit vector for this problem is 3 fifths i plus 4 fifths j. Now, let's see how this applies to a statics problem, rather than just looking at a simple vector r. So let's assume that our vector r was actually a force and it was a five Newton force. And we're gonna call that force FAB, which actually I just realized made a little bit of a mistake. And let me fix these letters here. So what we can see is that if we wanted to represent force AC as a magnitude, we would just use, again, Pythagorean theorem and take the square root of the x component plus the y component, and we would get five. If we wanted to represent it as a vector, that would also be acceptable, and that would just be three i plus four j, the same as before. Our unit vector for FAC, essentially, is three over five i plus four over five j. This is all we just showed on the last slide. Now, let's work backwards a little bit. If I wanted to write FAC as a vector, I could simply say that it's the unit vector times FAC. So if I highlight kind of the components here just so we don't get too confused, let's say that the unit vector is green. So we've got that right here. And then FAC is in blue. That's our magnitude. That's what we're multiplying right here. And that will get us back to what we have in yellow now. FAC. 
So when we do this, we get 3 over 5i plus 4 over 5j times 5, which leads us back to that FAC is equal to 3i plus 4j. What does this really mean? Essentially, what this means is that FACx is 3 newtons and FACy is 4 newtons. Pretty much everything we just said on the last slide, but now related to forces instead. So now let's talk about angles between our forces. We can see that if we had this force of 5 newtons, it has an angle of alpha relative to the x and an angle of beta relative to the y. So if we were to take the cosine of alpha, that would be the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which would be 3 over 5. Or really what that's saying is that the cosine of alpha is fx over f. Similarly, we could do the cosine of beta, that would be 4 fifths, and we'd have the cosine of beta also equal to fy over f. Now what does this really mean? Essentially, you've been using this format all along, but just without realizing it. So if you had had 5 newtons and you knew both alpha and beta, and I asked you to solve for the x component or the y component because you might need to do a sum of the forces, you would simply have said, ah, FACx is equal to FAC times the cosine of our angle here, alpha. Well, effectively, what that's doing is we're taking the magnitude of 5 and our cosine of alpha, if you pay close attention to the slide, is actually 3 fifths which is telling us the x component more or less. And you can see that that shows up right here. Again, in the end, what we see is that FACx is equal to a value of 3 newtons, which is what we would have expected. Now I understand a lot of this might be fairly confusing, but when you come back later on, when we discuss more 3D, I think it'll make sense to go through these slides a little bit to see what we've been doing in 3D and how it relates back to 2D. So let's talk about one more concept, really, before we kind of move on a little bit further. We'll talk about how you can find the angle between two vectors. In this case, what we'll be doing is we'll try and find the angle between our two vectors, AB and AC. Well, if you look, we've got AB right here down at the bottom, and we've got AC going this way. Our angle between those two things is going to be alpha. So how can we solve for alpha if we really only knew kind of the vectors? Now in 2D, this is very easy, but in 3D, it's going to get complicated, and that's why it's important to introduce this concept. So what we can use is this thing called the dot product, and essentially what we need to do is we need to say that alpha will be equal to cosine to the negative one of the dot product of our vectors divided by the magnitude of each multiplied together. Now let's see if we can follow along here as I kind of explain what the dot product is. So the dot product will effectively take the multiplication of 3i times 3i and it'll add that to plus 0 times 4. That's what this piece is right here at the top. Down at the bottom, we know that the bottom is just going to be 3 times 5, which is the magnitudes of both of our vectors, which we can see right here. And that's what this piece is going to become. So when we look how this plays out, we get that the alpha, or the angle between two vectors, is equal to the cosine to the negative 1 of the dot product of those two vectors, which in our case is just 3 times 3 plus 4 times 0. It gets us a value of 9 divided by 3 times 5. This will tell us that the cosine to the negative 1 of alpha of, is essentially cosine to the negative 1 of 3 fifths, which we know is going to be correct. So essentially, what the dot product allows us to do is find the angle between any two vectors, even in 3D, by following this format right here. All right, everybody, it's what you've been waiting for. Get out your fruity pebbles, your Danimals yogurt, or perhaps even your Lunchable, and take out the free 3D glasses that come inside, because it's about to get three-dimensional. I wish those animations actually did pop out of the screen, but... I'm not sophisticated enough to do that, so I'm sorry. 
But anyway, let's move on. Let's talk about how everything we just discussed relates to 3D. So there's also the Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions. Let's look at this cube or rectangle, uh, three-dimensional rectangle right here. What we can see is that the value of C, which let's highlight C so you can see what I'm talking about. C, 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 right here. Our value of C is the hypotenuse of the triangle with sides X and Y. So C squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared. Now let's look at the other vector, S. And if we look at S, what we can see is that S is the hypotenuse of a triangle made up by C right here and Z. So S squared is equal to C squared plus Z squared. So what you can see is that if we replace the C squared in our equation right here with what we just had before to the left, our equation for S squared becomes x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Now this is going to be relevant because effectively when we're dealing with three-dimensional forces and distances, we'll be able to say that f squared, a three-dimensional force squared, is equal to the sum of each of its parts in the x, y, and z dimension squared. Or, as we've typically been doing, we say that f is equal to the square root of the square root of fx squared plus fy squared plus fc squared. And this is also true for distances. Now when we talk about 3D angles, we have exactly the same thing that we were just talking about. The cosine of alpha is equal to the fx over f. Because effectively, the alpha is the distance between your vector here and the x-axis. If we look at the cosine of beta, what beta is referring to is that beta is actually the angle between your three-dimensional vector and the y-axis. And last but not least, gamma is the angle between your force and the z-axis. Now, a cool thing that you could do if you're really bored is to solve and prove this geometric equation right here which basically tells us that cosine squared alpha plus cosine squared beta plus cosine squared gamma, which would be equal to the following three things in the middle, is actually going to be equal to this right here pretty much, which will end up equaling 1. Now this is a very interesting proof more or less that you could do, but this could be relevant on the homework. So, I probably lost you, and you're probably very confused at this point, but stick with me. We've only got two more slides to go. Essentially, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this very simple two-dimensional problem, and I'm going to show you the exact steps you'll need to take, or that really you've been taking, to solve these problems. And then we're going to do a problem that shows how you take these same principles and apply them to a 3D problem. So... Here's what you do for every 2D and 3D problem, in theory. If we wanted to solve for the tensions in the rope, the first thing we would need to do is to find the coordinates in the problem. So we put points and label them for everything. That way we can say we've got tension AE and tension AC, and we have a weight of 100 newtons going down. So if we plug all of this in, now all we we'll want to do is we we'll want to define the important vectors. So the most important vectors in this particular problem are the two forces, force AE and force AC. So AE is going to be equal to E minus A. Effectively, we're just trying to figure out the direction of how to get from point A to point E. So let me erase these because our color is actually irrelevant here. And what we can see is that AE is essentially just E, the coordinates of E, minus the coordinates of A. So E is negative 4 and 3, A is 0, 0. Therefore, AE is negative 4 plus 3J, or negative 4 minus 0 plus 3 minus 0. We can see the exact same thing for AC, which is that AC will be C, the value of the coordinates of C, 
3 comma 4 minus the value of the coordinates of a. So that's going to get us 3 minus 0, which is 3i, plus 4 minus 0, 4j. So now what we need to do, now that we've gotten the vectors, is we need to get the magnitudes of the vector hypotenuses. Fortunately for us, we use Pythagorean theorem for both AE and AC, and our values are going to be the same. They're both 3, 4, 5 triangles. The next step we do is we define the unit vectors for each of our vectors. So remember that the unit vector is going to be equal to the vector form, and I'll highlight this on the slide so you can see more clearly. It's going to be the vector form of AE over the magnitude of AE, and that's what you can see right here. We've got negative 4 over 5i and 3 over 5j. If we look, the exact same thing will be true for AC. We take the magnitude of AC and divide that by sorry, take the vector form of AC, divide that by the magnitude, and we get that the unit vector of AC is 3 over 5i plus 4 over 5j. Now what we do is we sum the forces. Well, how do we do that? Effectively, what you can see is that the sum of the forces in the x direction is going to be equal to 4 fifths AE. Well, why is that the case? If we look, AE its x component was negative 4 over 5. So we've got negative 4, 5 times the magnitude of AE. Well, what value would that be? That would be negative 4. Then we do plus 3 fifths AC. And the reason why is because we have 3 fifths I. And we 3 fifths AC. If we sum the forces in the y direction, you could see we have 3 fifths times AE plus 4 fifths times AC, because both of them are going up and are positive, minus 100 newtons down, because that's the force going down, which we have right here. If you sum, now you've got the system of equations here, which with this system of equations, you can solve. We have two unknowns, AE and AC, and two equations. Therefore, we can solve and find that AC is 80 newtons and AE is 60 newtons. This is precisely what you've been doing all along. Pretty easy, right? Just remember these steps that we've highlighted here, steps 1 through 5, as we move to a three-dimensional problem, and I'll move to paper and pen to show you how to solve a problem that looks like this, which, holy shnikes, that looks crazy. So essentially, what we've got going on here is we've got a three-dimensional system with three cables. Cable AB, and I'll do these all in different colors so it doesn't bleed together too much. Cable AC, and last but not least, everybody's favorite cable, AD. We've got two external forces applied to our system. We've got force Q going up. This is going to be the force that we end up solving for. And we have one other force that's applied to our system, which is called force P. So our problem statement says we have three cables, AB, AC, and AD. And they're all attached at this singular point A right here. We have forces P, which we're told is in the Y direction, and force Q, which is purely in the Z direction now. We're asked if P equals 1200 Newtons, determine the value of Q, for which the tension in cable AD, this cable right here, between these two spots right here, is equal, is greater than zero. Note that Q is in the positive Z direction with a minimum value of zero. We're told, like usual, to draw our free body diagrams, put units on our answers, and to note the Y and Z coordinates of the anchor points, B and C are zero, and the Y coordinate of anchor point D is also zero. So you can see we've got a three dimensional axis here of X, Y, and Z. So 
essentially, this problem seems a little confusing first, but really there's only one thing we're trying to solve for, which is this force Q right here. So the problem is essentially just saying the following. What value of Q do we need to make the value of tension in this cable here, AD, greater than zero, which we'll be using the assumption that it is zero, because if we apply just a smidgen more at Q, then the tension in that cable would be greater than zero. So you can kind of imagine what would be happening here. We've got two cables down at the bottom. The harder we pull up at Q, the more slack will exist in cable AD. I mean, if I pulled up really, really hard with Q, and almost nothing with P, cable AD would be totally slack, which hopefully you can see. So what we'll do is we'll move on to the hand solution so you can follow all the steps that we just outlined on the previous slides and see how they apply to a three-dimensional problem. All right, now we're going to try and solve that problem that I just showed a second ago. And if you've been paying attention to all these videos, you realize I'm now at my third different desk in recording these lectures. So trying to keep things interesting for you. All right, so in the last example I showed you with 2D, there were five steps that we had to follow in order to do the problem. Step number one is the following, and it's probably the easiest and most straightforward step. So I always say that step number one to solve any 3D problem is to find the coordinates or establish the points. Now on the exam, this will usually be given to you, the points of everything, because we don't want you to make a simple mistake. But in most homework and group work, this will be a step that you have to do, because it's good practice for being out in the real world. So we'll say step number one is establish the points. Now in our particular case, there's going to be a couple points that really matter. Point A is going to matter. Point B is going to matter. Point C is going to matter. And point D is going to matter. Well, how did I know that those things are going to matter? Well, the easy answer is they have letters. So they must matter. Why else would they have letters? So that's kind of a stupid answer. But the reason why they matter is we know that we're going to have a tension, AC, pulling this way. We're going to have a tension, AB, pulling this way. Boop. And a tension, AD, pulling this way. The two forces that we have in our problem or we're going to have this value Q, which is pulling up. And our goal is to find Q. And the other force that we have in our problem is this other applied force called P. And our force is right here. All right. So establishing the points, we need to figure out the coordinates of A, B, C, and D. And in theory, this point O, which actually doesn't really matter, but everything is starting off of this point O. You can see that we've got our coordinate axes in this problem is a Z axis, an X axis, and a Y axis going this way. All right, so coordinate or point O is our zero, zero, zero point or our origin. The other point that we would probably want to establish now is A, B, and C, and D. So let's look at point A. If we look at point A, point A is along the y-axis, meaning that it's not on the x, either in the positive or the negative direction. Therefore, the x component of our point is zero. The next would be our y. Well, we can see that our y is 960 millimeters, but rather than do millimeters, I'm going to use meters. So we're going to say 0 0.96 meters. And then if we look at the z direction, we can see that point A is 240 millimeters off of the y-axis. So its z-coordinate is 0 0.24. Now we can do the same for point B. We can see that point B has an x distance of 380. It has no y and no z. So B is just 0 0.38, comma, 0, comma, 0. Now we can look at point C. Point C is 320 this way. 
And what I've done is I've defined that the positive x, y, and z axes are these ways. So point C, you can see, is actually in the negative x direction at a value of 320 millimeters. So we're going to say that C is negative 0 0.32. And again, it's not coming out on the y-axis, and it's not going up on the z. So we have 0, comma 0. And last but not least, the point in question is point D. Point D is not anywhere on the x. Sorry, it is on the x. So we can see that point D is equal to, so we can see that for point D, it goes up in the Z axis, over in the X axis in the negative direction, but nothing in the Y. So for D, we have negative 0 0.22, 0 in the Y, and 0 0.96. All right, step number one, establish the points. Now, what effectively are we going towards in the whole problem? The, the end goal is essentially to write an equation or write all of our sum of the forces, which is going to have a couple things. It's going to have the tension AB, which we need, plus the tension AC, plus tension AD, plus Q, max, plus P. And all of the sum of the forces, both in the x, the y, and the z, need to add up to zero. And that's why we're writing all these as vectors. Now, this is kind of just our end goal. And the one assumption that we're making is that if we pull up right here with q, what's going to happen is that the tension in this wire here is going to go to zero because it's going to get slack. So what we'll say is that TAD is zero. So really, we just have two things now that we have to worry about, AB and AC. So our next step in any three-dimensional problem, step number two, is to define the vectors that are important and their magnitudes. Now, because this whole problem is dealing with tensions, our problem is a lot more straightforward because the only things that we're going to have to write now are AB and AC. So when I'm looking to find the radius or the distance between A and B, I solve this by saying we have the coordinates of B minus the coordinates of A. Well, the coordinates of B are right here, 0 0.38, 0, 0. And the coordinates of A are 0, 0.96, and 0.24. So effectively, what we're doing when we do B minus A is we're saying, how did we get to B from point A? Well, the way that we did that is we do 0 0.38 minus 0, 0 minus 0 0.96, and 0 minus 0 0.24. So this gives us the following values. That RAB is 0 0.38I minus 0 0.96J minus 0 0.24 okay and we know that rab magnitude then is going to be equal to the square root of 0 0.38 squared plus 0 0.96 squared plus 0 0.24 squared I'm gonna move my uh, radical over and that's pretty much all we need right now. So now what we're going to do, so now what we do is we do the exact same process for AC. So I'll just go through that really quickly. I'll pause the video and write out the answer because it's the same procedure. Okay, what we can see I've just done is I've solved for the value of the magnitude of RAB by taking this square root, and I get that it's 1.06. I then followed the same exact procedure I did up here and wrote out the vector AC and the magnitude of AC. The reason we're writing it A to B and A to C is because our tension goes from A to B and A to C. Remember, tension can only ever pull outward. So that's why we're doing it this way. The next thing that we have to do is step number three, which is to find our unit vectors. 
Now remember that our unit vectors is equal to the essentially the vector of our radius, so in this case RAB over the magnitude of RAB. So if we're looking at the unit vector of AB, what we'll find is essentially that we're going to put 0.38 over 1.6, negative 0.96 over 1.6, negative 0.24 over 1.6. And what we get for the unit vector of this, AB, is going to be equal to 0 0.3585i. minus 0.9057j minus 0.2264k. Now, where did this come from? I'll just write it over here just so you can see it, and then I'll pause the video and do the same for C. But essentially, each one of these things came from 0 0.38 over 1.06i plus etc. So we're just using this and this to create the unit vector. I'll now pause the video and create the unit vector for C. Okay, now what you can see here is I've just done the same and I've created the unit vector of AC by taking the vector of AC and dividing it by the magnitude of AC. So I've got this right here. The next step, step number four, is to find the force vectors in our question. So the force vectors Remember, if this is our unit vector, our unit vector of tension AB is equal to the vector form of AB over the magnitude of AB. So if I want to get this right here, and I'll just circle this in red, I think that's kind of an important point. If I want to get tension AB as a vector, that's going to be equal to the magnitude of tension AB, which this right here is pretty much what we're trying to solve for. So the tension of AB vector is equal to the magnitude times the unit vector. Well, we just had the unit vector of AB, so effectively our tension force is going to be equal to TAB times all this good stuff up here. So I'll just write it one more time. It's kind of not really necessary to do this step. We could almost combine three and four together. I'm just trying to be ultra thorough for at least our first video. That way you can see and really try and follow along with what steps are happening. So that's going to be our tension AB vector. It's equal to the magnitude times the unit vector. And this is why we go through the trouble of finding the unit vector. It's because now here's the thing we're trying to solve for. So I'll just kind of write that tension AC as a vector is also going to be equal to TAC times U of AC. And the only other forces we have in our question are Q. So Q is purely in the Z direction. So Q is essentially just equal to Q times K. And this right here is our magnitude of Q. And the last other force we have is P, which P is equal to P in the Y, or P magnitude times J. So Q is one of the things we're really trying to solve for. And P is something that we are given, which was equal to 1,200 newtons. And Q, as we'll just say over here, was our question mark. In theory, we also don't know the tension in this or AC or AD. So really we have four unknowns, which is that's primarily the reason we had to say that TAD goes to zero. Otherwise, we would have been in trouble and not been able to write enough equations. So the fifth and final step is essentially to take our force vectors that we've just defined right here. And kind of put all this together so it's a little more clear. 
Step number five is to do our statics. Sum of the forces. So if we got the sum of the forces, what we're gonna do? Let's write them out. Sum of the forces in the x equals zero. Here's where we'll take all of the x forces in our problem. Well, if you look, TAB has an x component. So we have 0 0.3585 TAB. And that came from right here. TAC is also going to have an x component, which is negative 0 0.3077. So here we have minus 0 0.3077. TAC. Now if we look here, this equation has two things, A, B, and A, C, and we can't solve. And again, Q has a J as a Z component and P has a Y component. So neither of those have an X component. The next equation we're going to write is the sum of the forces in the Y direction. And if we set that equal to zero, what we'll get is the Y component of AB and the Y component of AC. So we have negative 0 0.9057 AB minus 0 0.921 or 9231 AC. And now remember, we're in the Y. And the other thing that we have in the Y is this P that goes along the Y axis. And that's going in the positive axis, so we say plus 1200. Now we write one more equation, which is our sum of the forces in the z direction. We set that equal to zero. Both AB and AC have a z component. So we write those out. So we have negative 0 0.2264 AB minus 0 0.23 AC. The last thing we have in the z is our Q which we're saying was going up, which we defined as positive Z. So we say plus Q max. Now, if you look here, let's get some different colored pens out. We can see that we've got AB in our X equation, AB in the Y, and AB in the Z. We also have AC here, as well in all three equations. And then we have one other unknown, which one other unknown, which is Q max. So essentially, right now, what we can see we have is three equations and three unknowns. We are in business and can solve this by using a system of equations and pretty much solving for AB in terms of AC here, plugging that into Y and solving for one, then going back to the X, solving for the other, then plugging both of those things into our Z equation and solving finally for Q max. Which when we do this, we will get the final answers, which I'll kind of put up here because we've run out of room on the rest of the page. And what we find is that Tension AB, the magnitude is equal to 606 newtons. Tension AC is equal to a magnitude of 706 newtons. And Q max is equal to 300 newtons. And we box all of our final answers. And we are now done our first 3D problem. And although it may have looked scary to begin with, by following these simple steps of number one, establishing the points, number two, defining the vectors and magnitudes, number three slash four, setting up your unit vectors and slash or force vectors, and then step number five, summing the forces, the problem becomes pretty straightforward. Now, what you'll see eventually is that, you know, we got a little bit lucky in that a and B, um, Q and P were all kind of, you know, resulted in this a little bit simpler equation here. But it might be possible that Q could have been like in the X, Y, and Z axes. 
and so could have p. So that would have made our lives a lot trickier to solve the system of equations, and that's where we move into the next lecture, which is how to use matrix math to solve a more sophisticated system of equations faster. And that's pretty much it. So I will upload the solutions to this. You can find them on the slides. And that is the end of our first lecture on 3D. Thanks for watching, everybody. Gaffietti here, rolling out until the next episode of Triple D 3D Statics.